So we have a few people joining and we are right on time, which is great. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the session on navigating digital waters. How do tech innovations transform education? It's my pleasure to introduce you the moderator today, Harsh Mehta. He's a second, uh, second year student of SPJ Institute of Management and Research in India and is our prime global student regional leader in Central and South Asia. Thank all the speakers for joining us. And uh, Harsh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you for the generous introduction. First, I'll be just briefing about what the panel uh, discussion is going to be about today. After COVID-19, universities have begun incorporating technology more fervently than ever. Universities worldwide have moved to online lectures and examinations. For instance, even AI has been experienced in delivering lectures to students. In this transition, the focus has been shifted from knowledge acquisition to critical thinking. The panel today will discuss the factors behind this trend, how it benefits students, and how students can utilize this opportunity for their future development. We have an esteemed and diverse panel with us today. Please allow me to introduce them to you. Our first panelist is Dr. Pin, Pin Pin T. McCon. Dr. Pin Pin is a faculty member at the Sassen School of Management and a founding member of the Sassen Data Analytics Center. She received her PhD and MS from Stanford in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University. Her expertise is in computational psychology, artificial intelligence, and data science. She, al she is also the Artificial Intelligence Venture Partner at Vector Capitals, an early-stage climate tech venture capital in San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Dr. Pinpin, to the panel discussion. Privileged to have you with us today. Hi, thank you, everyone. Our second panelist is Mr. Christian Jewell. Christian is an award-winning educator, facilitator, and social entrepreneur who founded White Light Education in 2016. Christian specializes in offering facilitation and training in culture, innovation, co-design, and design thinking. Although his work serves a diverse range of clients, he's particularly passionate about working with young people, recognizing that empowering this generation is an investment in the future of our planet. We are delighted to have you with us today, Christian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harsh, and welcome, everybody. Our third panelist today is Mr. Ashish Srivastav. Ashish is a co-founder and CEO of Finland Education Hub, a bridge connecting Finnish education companies and India's K-12 education ecosystem. With over 14 years of experience in strategy and business development across different industries, he has a passion for making education relevant and impactful for the future generation. He is also associated with the positive impact rating, which evaluates B schools based on their societal impact and their commitment to continuous improvement. Thank you, Ashish, for joining us today. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ursh. Thank you for having me here. And our final speaker for today is Mr. Ali Muhammad. Ali is a MBA student at the American University in Cairo and founder and CEO of CEO. CIVO is recognized as Africa's top 15 climate tech startup and is a pioneer in creating eco-friendly maritime solutions whose products are used for outdoor creation, aquatic drones, and serves various other applications like data collection and rescue operations. As Ali is also studying MBA, he remains steadfast in his commitment to blending business acumen with environment responsibility and contribution to social and ecological well-being. Welcome, Ali. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Hash, and welcome, everyone. So let me get straight to the panel. My first question goes to Dr. Pinpin. Dr. Pinpin, I recognize uh, when you shared the slides with me, I was particularly intrigued by the first thing that you mentioned in your slide, where you mentioned online plus learning is not equal to online learning. Can you tell us more about what you really meant by that equation? Sure. Um, so I guess I should pull up that slide. <laughs> okay, let me do that quickly. You can, uh, yes. you can also speak about it if required. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I hope it comes up. Anyways, so yeah, basically, um, my usually when we say online learning, right? So 
online and and what Harsh just said is online learning is not equal to online plus learning. So what do I mean by that? So basically, online learning from um is not just you know putting a video camera in the classroom and stream it online, right? So it's not just traditional learning uh, combined with the internet. So it's not just that. Um, in order to implement, you know, an actually effective online learning, there are, you know, several um, factors that go into it. For example, um, the interactivity of the class. So, you know, like the videos may not be an, a one hour class, but maybe, you know, cut down into clips, chunks of like three minutes, five minutes. Um, and then, you know, there are discussion um, with, among, you know, the students, you know, outside of the class, you know, an online discussion on top of, you know, just lectures, um, maybe an inclusion of a mobile app, games, you know, polling uh, activities for students to do on other uh, machines, not just watching videos. Also, you know, office hours for, the teaching staff to help students with answering their questions and gain more interactivity. And of course, also the assignments, you know, also must be redesigned to incorporate, you know, time for students to go offline and work and reflect on the materials themselves. And so that's why I'm trying to say that online learning is not just, you know, putting the traditional classroom into the internet, but entails more details in, you know, adapting the virtual learning for students. So that's what I meant. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinpin. I mean, it makes it very clear that you no know, online learning is not just putting your classroom, uh, sending a Zoom link across and doing that. I mean, it entails more than that. And the uh, design of education has to be done accordingly. When he, uh, talking of design, it reminds me of Christian. You know, Christian has been a pioneer in terms of human-centered design and co-design. So Christian, coming to you, what do you think are some of the elements that you take across, uh, that you consider while designing content, especially when it is digital content? Yeah, great question, Harsh. And, and thanks, uh, Pimpin, for what you shared as well. Um, when COVID happened in 2020, um, I thought my company was going to go bankrupt. And I had already been doing quite a bit of uh, online work, but 90% of my work was face-to-face. -face. So I'm quite experienced in teaching and facilitating in person. And as, a, as an educator, for those of us who are educators, you learn certain soft skills for how to create a container uh, that allows people to feel safe to engage and participate. Now, pretty quickly in about a couple of weeks, all of my clients were emailing saying, can we do this thing that we were going to do in person online? And I said, yes, I didn't really know how. And I had to learn very quickly uh, how to, to tailor those face-to-face -face experiences to become online. Now, obviously, Pinpin has shared uh, there's quite a big difference because the tools that we're using and allowing time and space for those is very important. However, what I did find is that the need for human connection is even greater online than in person. We can take some of these things for granted when we're in person, the rapport, the body language, these uh, subtle things. When we're online, there are different, different ways we have to do that and more deliberately. So I learned very quickly and very simply uh, to look into my webcam as if I was looking into the eyes of the people in my room. And I also realized that um, good body language on camera, so smiling, nodding, the use of emojis and reactions in Zoom and other platforms, all of these things give us the usual social cues that we have in person in an online environment. So that's probably the, the soft skills part of it. Then the, the whole experience design, I could talk for hours about that, but this is all about empathy for me. We're putting ourselves in the shoes of our audience. And that's a design skill as a designer that you practice empathy. Absolutely. Thank you, Christian, for bringing that point. You know, there are some hard skills, hard technical skills to it. And there are these softer nuances that we take for granted usually when it's a room. And most importantly, I think even uh, being a student in an online mode, it is very important to make, carry everyone along. You know, you can have 
four or five people connected to you throughout, but the rest just switch off their cameras and they are gone and you lose them forever. So very important to design content so that everyone, you know, you carry everyone along. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Let Ajay. me come across to Ashish. Uh, Ashish, you have been, uh, before the uh, positive impact rating, let me come back to your first venture, which is involved uh, in, you know, benchmarking the Indian education system against the Finnish education system and trying to improve them and uh, uh, giving some suggestions as to how the improvements can be done. Can you tell us some innovative, you know, pedagogies that maybe the Finnish education system follows and something that all of us can learn from? Oh, excellent. And that's that's something I can, again, uh, fully agree with, with Christian and, and being able to relate what he mentioned uh, about about the challenges, but again, going back to the Finnish education system there. So when you talk to Finns, it's, they don't relate it as, as to be the best or, or brag about it's the best education system in the world. How they call it is it's the most, um, it's the closest to a common sense based education system where the transition is happening around things which are more relevant, around competencies, about skill building. So, you know, one of the, one of the things that I didn't want to talk about was with the with the with the changing technology and how fast it's changing. The skills we had before, or the knowledge we had before, is not going to stay relevant anymore in times to come. So, how are we working on preparing, um, you know, students or 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 kids for the future? And that's a big question that is being addressed at the school level, but also at the university level. And how are you equipping the the students with the new skills? Um, which they can use for the future. So Finns uh, focus a lot on the competency building and transversal skills, unlike the subjective knowledge. In fact, um, you know, very recently there was there was news about that Finland is, is planning to get rid of the subjects. Because yes, you know, knowledge is something that at some point was, uh, accessibility was an issue, but with technology, knowledge is available everywhere and you can, I think the bigger question is how much validated information is coming across to you and how do you make use of it? So uh, what we're trying to do with, with the Finnish education system is first of all, focus on relevance, you know, relevance of education. And the second bit is upskilling teachers or educators, you know, um, Christian will, will kind of agree to this fact that, you know, one of the, one of the bigger problems, especially with, with emerging economies is, that we do see a lot of educators, however, they're not equipped, they are not trained effectively in order to impart the skills or use the latest pedagogical methods for their schools. So I think that's the focus area where, where we see, uh, you know, Finland can be a great benchmark to what we are doing here in the Indian subcontinent. So I hope, you know, that kind of covers to a certain extent your question. Yes, Ashish, thank you so much. I mean, there are a lot of things. It's like, you know, we, we can, there's no need to reinvent the wheel always. You know, we can learn from each other very easily that way. But it's all about, you know, sharing that, understanding that, Absolutely. and most importantly, contextualizing that in, you know, in the particular country that you want to apply. If you try to force fit something into another, it may be a disaster. Thank you so much, Ashish, for bringing that. Let me come across okay. to Ali. You know, Ali here wears a double hat amongst all of us. He's a student as well as an entrepreneur. So, uh, Ali, I'll, uh, your answers, I would expect, you know, you can bring both perspectives into that. So, first, uh, you know, uh, uh, first is I, you are already, you know, your startup is there, one of the top 15 uh, climate tech startups in Africa. Uh, one thing is I, I was going through your product list. So uh, one thing, can you tell us a little bit more about the product that you have, uh, a brief, and then is there any, you know, uh, in terms of any artificial intelligence that you used in that particular product? Can you tell us something more about it? Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for having me today. So uh, my startup, Sivu, is developing a sustainable product in the maritime sector. So we are focusing on reducing the carbon footprint in the maritime industry by introducing an electric powered watercrafts and enable it with IoT connectivity with the fleet management system. So we are enabling businesses to have a sustainable uh, electric watercrafts and uh, utilize it in their day-to-day -day operations. 
And the other thing uh, of our devices is the marine drone. So we have like an autonomous uh, DJI uh, product, but in the maritime sector, if you, you can relate to DJI drones, but in the maritime sector, uh, but uh, we are using it for data collection. So we are doing underwater mapping for the coral reefs. Uh, because you know, because of the uh, the CO two emission and a lot of climate changes happening. Meanwhile, uh, the underwater ecosystem are gradually dying, and we are trying to measure uh, the changes that ha is happening. Meanwhile, uh, and as well as uh, farming new fish farms and coral reefs, and monitor those uh, activities that have been happening. This is like in brief what we are doing. So we are in incorporating so many technologies in terms of like AI uh, for mapping, for navigating in the sea because the the sea is like an, a very dangerous uh, environment. And what we have explored about the the space and the uh, the outer space is way more than we discovered about our oceans. Uh, however, uh, using like such a new technologies we incorporated in our company uh, in navigating uh, our drones uh, from fish farms to another or exploring that harsh environment leveled us like significantly. Uh, and the thing is actually like going back to the initial question, which is the COVID-19, what happened in terms of COVID-19? Although the catastrophic event, like we, we've been like locked down, but it enabled the, uh, it broke the resistance of the customers and especially in the MENA region uh, or the Middle East specifically to the digital products. So back then, like there is some of resistance between the, the, uh, the tech startups and the, uh, and the clients because they didn't tend like, to use or to facilitate their uh, day-to-day -day activity using digital products. But they had to, when COVID had, they had to, to implement those products. And this has actually helped us like, to introduce new tech and equip ourselves uh, with, with new technologies that it was been easier to introduce to the, uh, to, to the customers. So uh, on the other side, from like business school or from like the university itself, we, 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 we noticed like a sudden change in terms of how the, the content has been delivered, uh, the agility of the university, especially in the American University in Cairo. So there was like plans uh, have been executed faster than we expected uh, to cope with the, with the changes. But the thing is, it's not, it wasn't a temporary thing, but it became like a lifestyle in the university. And this is easy. The, the students' lives and the uh, and also the the students and, and the um, uh, the professors as well, and that increased our productivity. Thank you, Ali, for sharing both the perspectives. That is in terms of the product that you have, and also what you as a student feel uh, at the American University in Cairo. That how content is being delivered now post COVID nineteen. Thank you so much. Uh, coming uh, back to Dr. Pinpin, uh, I want to ask you particularly uh, one particular thing that is usually uh, you know uh, kind of being raised uh, too often nowadays that chat gpt and generative ai is now you know entered the classroom almost every laptop has them installed uh, but al always uh, you know flip side of that is often educators believe that this sometimes hinders your process of thinking sometimes because it gives you results on its own it gives you direct results and which may you know, hinder your natural process of thinking. So how do you think educators and even students use chat GPT or generative AI in a better way such that it does not hinder the natural process of thinking? Yeah, so big questions for all educators, I believe, right? Um, and, and the way I see it, uh, I think the easiest analogy is to compare chat GPT like a calculator. So the way you would, you know, teach students to use calculators uh, would be like, you cannot forbid them from, you know, using calculators forever because, you know, it makes their lives faster. But again, at the same time, you want your children to understand mathematics. And, you know, there are also a lot of skills that you learn through learning mathematics. And so uh, the way I see it is, you know, like a calculator in the early ages, and I would say, you know, like primary school, even like middle school, students should be forbidden from using chat GPT at all. So like um, 
not in classrooms at least, so that students can, you know, learn the necessary skills in order to develop creativity, critical thinking, you know, language skills, how to summarize stuff. Um, and once they know how to do those things, then you slowly introduce the tool. So you slowly, you know, introduce ChatGPT, um, introduce guidelines on how it could be best used. Uh, and, you know, like work, have students work with ChatGPT in order to augment those skills that they already have in order to create something that is, you know, even more advanced and more useful and, you know, in a more efficient way. And so, yeah, that's that's how I see, you know, how educators and students can work with ChatGPT together. And actually, ChatGPT could actually give students, you know, more insights to some topics that teachers won't have time to go to students individually. So I have, you know, students who talk to ChatGPT for it to clarify concepts for him in the classroom where, you know, in a lecture hall with 200 students, the professor won't, don't have time to go through it to everyone. Absolutely, I totally agree you know, on that particular point that you cannot forbid it. I know uh, current reactions sometimes are like a knee-jerk reaction that you totally forbid students from doing it altogether. Rather, I think, you know, some kind of discussion should be there as to what extent you should use it, what is the purpose you are using it for, so that it does not, you know, uh, like we were discussing, that does not hinder your natural ways of learning altogether. Thank you so yes, much, Dr. Was. Yeah. Yeah. And also to verify whether what it's saying is, you know, makes sense or not as well. No, absolutely. That is another you know, point about LLMs, large language models going on, about the, you know, uh, whether the content that it's giving is the correct content or not. And when you produce it as is uh, like that, uh, who is going to verify that? You know, thank you so much. That's an important point. Coming back to Christian. Christian, uh, can you give us some, uh, you know, more examples in terms of, I, I see that you've worked even with governments, you work with uh, city, uh, municipal corporations, you work directly with universities. So how do you contextualize your content in that way? Like you have to give a certain kind of uh, training to uh, education mm -hmm. institute, to a city municipal corporation. How do you design content and what is the process that you follow? Oh yeah, great question. I I really wanted to continue on uh, Pin Pin's uh, uh, please, tangent. Please, 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 you can do that. Well, just a couple of things I, I did want to add, um, which I found really insightful, Pin Pin, because I hadn't been aware of the critical thinking that I have developed through my education that allows me to use these tools well now. And in design, one one of the things that we focus on is a principle called generative thinking. It's basically when you say yes and to an idea, you start with something and you build and it becomes more than the sum of its parts. This is what I love about ChatGPT and, and other generative AI is that if I give it good quality input, it will help me create good quality output, but it only helps about 30%. So the important thing for me is the critical thinking where the prompts are good, where I'm asking the right questions. And I think this is going to segue Hush into your question, um, but also to pick up from Ashish earlier and the Finnish education system, because in a previous role, I have worked with schools across the world, actually, and, and uh, understood various uh, approaches to education. And I know in Finland, it's um, there has been a move toward project-based learning, which is your uh, or real-world learning or action-based learning, we call it. And in that type of learning, you are practicing principles. I think maybe it was Einstein or somebody else who said there are many methods, but only a few principles. So uh, if you understand the principles, you can apply the method of your choice. I think technology is like this. If we understand the principle and the purpose, we can choose the right technology. So a quick answer to your real question, Harsh, is the principles that I teach uh, and implement, they work in every context. And the methods are different for different clients, for different people. Uh, if I'm working with school kids, uh, slightly different, but the principles are still the same. So some, I'll give you some examples of prin principles. Empathy is one. Um, vulnerability, uh, uh, lateral thinking, creativity, 
uh, generative thinking, I think I've said as well, um, uh, embracing risk and being open to, to failure as well, experimentation. These are all principles that can be applied in learning uh, to learn, to essentially learn through doing. That's something I'm very passionate about. Thank you so much, Christian, for bringing that, you know, unique perspective. Also, you know, catch, uh, uh, continuing the conversation that Pinpin, you know, started and telling us more about the principles because, you know, that is something we have to learn from you. You are expert at that. So thank you so much for bringing that. Ashish, let me come back to you. Now in your other hat, which is you also associate yourself with the positive impact rating, where you evaluate B schools, you go to B schools, see they are teaching pedagogies, uh, methodologies, and you kind of, you know, evaluate them, benchmark them against each other. So what are some of the unique uh, things that you have come across at what kind of institutes that you know, they are using to deliver content in a better way? So great question, Harsh. Um, you know, with the with the positive impact rating, first of all, we it's it's a rating, which means that we want to assess and help schools develop capacity to do more in terms of impact and sustainability. Um, and it's one of the initiatives that has helped. So we have had certain schools who have been with us right from 2020, and they have seen a progression in terms of. Um, you're walking the talk, you know. So there are a lot of business schools who uh, commit to sustainability, commit to certain certain ideas. But then, how do you know if it's really happening? And we believe that there is no better voice than that of students because there are different methodologies being used. However, students, yeah, we believe that you know students are are the ones who are the most honest voice of of what's really happening inside. And year on year, they are the ones who can provide evidence of there has ch something changed or not. So I think the first bit is around the curriculum. So how do you, how do you impart education about um, sustainability and impact? And that's the first thing that has to go into the day-to-day -day teaching methodology, which of course the schools are now starting to do, but more so it's about the real life experiences and how do you connect it with what's happening on ground? Are you taking initiative? So I'll take one example of, um, XLRI, you know, which is which is a school in India and, and has been with us for the past couple of years, they work very closely with the local community. And this is in general about the global south or global southern schools, where there are challenges within the society and uh, close coordination is required between schools and the society to bring about a change. So they work with a lot of schools around, uh, especially around skill building, which means they have partnered with several NGOs in their circle and uh, on, on a weekly, bi-weekly basis, they go and work around different skill set for the children there, where they can develop things like, um, you know, developing skills around, around carpentry, around, around different things, which later could be utilized in a different way. So that's one of the projects that's been done. The other one is how to cut down waste. It's, it's, it's a very simple thing and it's being utilized, but how do you do that at a societal level is what we are seeing schools doing a lot. And a similar example is um, uh, Centrum School, which is which is in Peru, you know, which is the Latin America, so the South America region, where we also see a lot of different initiatives being taken in order to live by by leading the example of of sustainability and impact. So, you know, those are some of the examples I could I could quote uh, on the top of my head. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that, Ashish. I mean, while we talk digital. We also need to understand the digital divide that we live in currently and only there is a certain portion of people who have access to those digital tools and how do you not leave behind the ones who do not have this particular kind of access yeah. as of now. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Let me come back to Ali. You know, Ali, I was really uh, interested in asking you one particular thing that, you know, uh, you mentioned in that document as well. Uh, you mentioned that how can you leverage artificial intelligence for team optimization in startups you mentioned this i am really i you know i want to know what you mean by that and secondly i also want to ask you in terms of the job opportunities that you see now at your university maybe you are an entrepreneur you are not job seeking currently but there might be some colleagues of yours will go out there seeking jobs what is the kind of job requirements that are emerging or rather i would say the necessary skills that are now uh, have 
you have to take uh, with you in when you start uh, when you join the industry all right so how we are optimizing ai within our team so after like the the emerging new technologies and chat gpt for example like started to pop up in every and every uh, uh, occasion so we tend to use those tools like pen pen has mentioned it, it became like an, an an accessory tool but it doesn't mean that we can utilize that tool without the proper skills or the proper knowledge but if we going to input some of the data that like random data or uh, not filtered or not qualified enough you won't get the result that you're uh, seeking about or, or the, the data that you're uh, looking for so in our team for example we tried like to use those uh, ai tool instead of uh, increasing the human power of the repetitive work and uh, trying actually to validate our ideas or progress using some of the AI tools, not only ChatGPT, but in so many occasions. So the thing is, the thing that we tend to use for like, uh, or to validate using like uh, two weeks, a month or something, we can leverage AI by inputting our data and our research results and try to validate those data. And the thing is when the AI like try to uh, give us like some of the data, we have the obligation to uh, check if it's uh, resourceful or it, 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 is it generative or it is something uh, that we can rely on those data. So the team is now at the meanwhile, we are teaching our team and leveraging our team by how we're using AI tools uh, and how to obtain those skills. And that reflected on our uh, hiring plans uh, or the skills that, that we are looking for. So now we are we, we are in the need for more skillful people and has like wide uh, wide spectrum of knowledge where it has depth of understanding of each specific topic. So we can't rely on AI uh, independently or of generating ideas or generating new topics or or uh, using it as like a source of operations. However, the man or the engineer behind the laptop who input the, the, the data and give the right prompts to the AI models, this is the real value. So we, we and, and that actually increased the skill set that we are looking for, not only for us, but most of the companies, meanwhile, there is like we, we have noticed around us, meanwhile, in the startup ecosystem, uh, that new jobs opportunity called prompt engineers. So prompt engineer, uh, the, the, the role of a prompt engineer is to understand the topic specifically and them and write the right prompts to the AI in order to get the right answers or uh, facilitate those answers. And this is actually reflecting over the educational system. So we need more qualified uh, graduates uh, in the, that has like the better understanding, leveraging the AI tools to increase the productivity or, uh, or their learning curve. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we are relying on AI 100%. It is a tool like Pen Pen and everyone mentioned, but we need the depth and the skill set. And this is actually what most of the companies are relying on. So one more thing, actually, uh, that most of the people are afraid that AI is going to replace uh, humans or going to, to like uh, uh, get rid of the jobs. It's not going to happen, but it increased the bar and the skill set. So we need more skillful people. And actually ourselves, we are leveraging ourselves and learn how to facilitate those technology uh, in a better way. Absolutely, Ali. I mean, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, you uh, as a recruiter is also looking for certain skill sets now, which were earlier kind of unheard of. But also, we have to be flexible in the way that, you know, not everyone will carry those skill sets. And sometimes, you know, they may pick it up on the job or, you know, uh, something like that. And uh, you mentioned one particular point, which I think Christian also mentioned earlier as to the quality of inputs that you give to uh, a generative AI program, which is in terms of the prompts that you give it to get uh, to get the desired result. So thank you for bringing that, uh, Doctor Pinpin. Coming back to you, I uh, I noticed one interesting example that you mentioned that you know how AI can be used to develop a personal tutor for someone in the classroom. Can you tell us more about it? I mean, what does this uh, what does this concept of personal tutor using Gen AI mean? Yes. So basically, and this is, well, this is a real, and actually they, it, it wasn't my idea. It's just something that I saw students doing. 
is and and many students so basically what happens in class right so you're sitting you know you're one of like the 30 100 200 people um sitting in a class you know it's just the uh, professor talk or the teacher talks about things that he or she think you would understand but of course every student has their own background they have their own you know personal um knowledge and so each and every one of the students don't have the same um background right and what what students, what the student I saw and like several students I saw is, so suppose when I was teaching my class and I said some technical terms unknowingly, students would go to ChatGPT asking about, you know, what that term means. And if chat, and there, if there are some terms that ChatGPT gives you that you still don't understand, then you kind of like having this back and forth conversation with the chatbot, you know, and the chatbot explains you in a sense to, eventually make the student understand. And another student was using it for his um, accounting class. I think he's a university student. So um, he doesn't follow what the professors say in class. And like, sometimes he doesn't even know where to start asking. And so um, like chat GPT, in a sense, it's like a personal tutor because you can have conversations with them. You can ask it only the points where you don't understand and it will give you answer. But of course, that also comes with the students um, cross-checking the reference on the internet later. But, you know, it's still an easier process than the student going and, you know, Google these things themselves. Well, thank you so much. That is an interesting perspective because, you know, uh, the ratios kind of ratios that we, uh, especially I, I think Ashish would agree to me that, you know, in terms of the emerging market that you have a one is to 100 or a one is to 50 kind of ratio in terms of educator to number of students. Yeah. So it is definitely possible that you may lose out someone even in a physical setting, uh, not online. And, you know, it is the ultimate goal is to not lose out someone. And if chat gpt or gen ai helps you do that and carry them along at their own comfortable pace then definitely i mean it is i could say it is uh, more of an inclusive technology then if it uh, you know finds that kind of real application thank you thank you so much uh, ashish you raised your hand you had something to add just one point harsh you know and and this is again with with uh, leveraging technology so i think especially for the emerging markets technology is playing a huge role. So as you mentioned that the ratios are very different. And when you look into schools, it's one is to 40, one is to 30. And how do you personalize education? But with technology, if you're able to document it right, you can assess and analyze the data to a much further extent in order to understand where certain students are struggling, where certain students are doing smarter, and, and how do you align things in order for them to catch up? So I think technology is playing a fundamental role there, and we are also leveraging that into, into um, our systems that we are implementing, wherein it's helping us to document and analyze um, how each child or how each student is performing. And then if they have an interest in a certain particular domain, we let them do it more. But if there's someone struggling, then you know the teachers or the educator can handhold or support to help them rise. So yeah, the, just, just that. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that. One is the student shouldn't be left behind. And second, it helps the faculty in terms of core co course correction if they want to. They can get real-time feedback uh, like that. Christian, you raised your hand. Why don't you go ahead? Well, I knew it was going to be my turn next and I wanted to continue the, <laughs> the conversation. Please, please um, th there's been a movement in, in um, school-based education at least for over a decade away from uh, transferring knowledge to um lighting a spark essentially they the saying is from the sage on the on the stage to the guide on the side and i op operate at the fringe of education i don't i don't work for any uh universities i have lectured and taught for various universities but i am independent so i enjoy being on the fringe as a facilitator and great teachers are now facilitators they're creating the environments like an architect, like I used to be, they're creating the environments for students to thrive. And I, I see that as the great possibility with technology because every great teacher will want to provide personalized learning experiences for their students to allow them to explore their own individual curiosity and um, build their own talents and gifts. And in the way that uh, Pinpin and Ashish have been talking, 
uh, technology and, and um, generative tools particularly can personalize and tailor that experience for students so that their curiosity can be explored more easily, which is perfect. That, that's the, the future, the promise of, of technology. Thank you so much, Christian, for bringing that. I mean, I totally, you know, uh, that uh, the saying that you told, I can't forget it now. I, I, I will definitely use it somewhere else on some other forum. Please allow me to do that. <laughs> yeah, but Was it, I didn't create it, so I, I passed it on to you, Ash, and you <laughs> yeah. pass it on Sa from definitely. the safe stage to the guide on the side. Guide on the side. That's just amazing. Uh, Dr. Pinpin, you raised your hand. You want to add something? Yes, just a little quickly to Christian on the point that, you know, um, like students are, oh, sorry, like educators are mostly, you know, the guide on the side and the principle that I found very effective for students is, you know, for students to learn how to learn by themselves, not like waiting for teachers to, you know, give things to them. And that will be even more important in the, you know, generative AI world where, you know, you can basically almost do learn everything by yourself. You almost need to learn everything by yourself because technology is always changing. Absolutely. Can I throw one more thing in, Hush? Please do, please do. No well, problem. just just on that, this is great uh, energy. And Ali, I wanted to reference you at some point. Uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, so much of what we're, um, what we're doing here is creating entrepreneurial students. Now, you don't need to start your own company, but we want our young people to think like entrepreneurs. And that is essentially... For me, entrepreneurialism is taking something of uh, high value from a low yield environment to a high yield environment. It's the transfer yeah. of specialist knowledge. So this is ability to problem solve and be critical, be bored and figure out, you know, tinker. That is really empowering our students to be entrepreneurs. And they say, if this works in physics, could it work? in environmental uh, development, you know, this idea, it's the transferring that we, we see the innovation. So Absolutely. the thing is- Yeah, um, please continue, Ali. Yeah, yeah, please yeah continue. Uh, adding to that, actually, uh, for the past decade, uh, environmental aspect, uh, it was like, uh, for so many people, it was like a charity thing. It's, it's nice to have movement. However, it, it's not necessarily to be that way, actually. So this is what we have noticed changing in the schools, actually like introducing the entrepreneurial mindset, not only for environmental, but exchanging the knowledge in terms of business and how we can uh, doing something more impactful in most of the environment and education and so many things, but in the very entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial mindset. And from my experience, it's about agility and how you can change uh, the message you are delivering to add more value to the people or the community around you. And this is actually something we learned along the way that we can do entrepreneurial thing without building a company, but you have to take the initiative and have to be agile like to the delivery what adds value to the human around you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christian Ali. And very important. I mean, not everyone can found their own company, but at least think like an entrepreneur and you can, you know, uh, do better utilization of resources and accordingly that way. Thank you so much. We are almost only, uh, you know, on time, only two minutes to go. So uh, I would just like to ask if uh, any audience have, has any questions, you can feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, any audience members would like to ask any questions to the panelists, if any. I currently don't see any questions. So I think uh, we are almost on time. So uh, uh, can I just give quickly all of you, you know, the, uh, maybe 15 or to 30 seconds, you can just give your final words on the particular topic before we conclude. Uh, why don't we start with Pinpin? You can go ahead and then we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, 30 seconds. I'll say uh, keep learning, make yourself an AI. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll just say technology is the tool, but you are the, the, the maker. So be the creator in, in your own life. Thank you, Christian. Ashish? 
Okay, yeah, but we'll make it quick. So I believe technology is gonna transform access, uh, engagement, and the way outcomes happen, you know, at the at the level of education, whether it's higher or or school education. So yeah, and thank you for for having me here and to allow me to share my perspective. Thank you, Ashish. Ali. Um, I believe entrepreneurs are going to change the world. Uh, so I, I think we 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 should like utilize the technology to make an impact for all the communities around us. Thank you so much, and I think. Although we could not narrow down our discussion to one particular thing, but I think we opened up a lot of discussion areas and I think uh, we can take it forward whenever we have the opportunity to further delve on these. I think all of the topics that we uh, 